you are very welcome to this video and as you can see outside it is an autumnal dark damp wet typical north of England day and the weather's only going to get worse for the next few months and the days are going to get shorter and many of us will be having a difficult winter there's no question about that so I wanted to do a good news study today and this good news study relates to immunity now I know a lot of you all of you won't all want to watch this video so I'm going to give you the bottom line fairly quickly. Studies have been done now on immunity to SARS coronavirus 2 which causes COVID-19 for six to eight months which is really all the time we've had to analyse it because we simply haven't enough time yet. You know a year's time we could be doing this for 18, 18 months data but now it, it, this is all we can do. But the bottom line is it's looking good. The immune response is looking good, both in terms of antibodies and these B and T cells. So it's looking fairly promising for long-term immunity. And of course, that has got immense implications for the, for the success of the vaccine. And we know that the major manufacturing uh, manufacturers and developers of the vaccine have told us that, as well as the antibody response, we are getting the, uh, the, the lymphocyte response, the B and T cell response. So that's looking good. And I'm also going to consider this in the context of other beta coronaviruses, which is the SARS coronavirus 2 type virus. The Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, first identified in 2012, not well studied, but immunity from that seems to last for at least two years, probably longer, it's just not well studied. But the SARS coronavirus 1, which caused the 2003 pandemic, we know immunity from that in terms of the T cell response is now lasting for 17 years. And again, that, that's all the time we've had. So in the context of what we know and in the context of other viruses and in the context of all the current science we have, the immunity for longer term immunity is looking very hopeful. So um, that's what this virus is about. If you, if you want to pack the video now, then go away uh, feeling very hopeful about immunity. <laughs> if you want the details, of course, I'll be sticking around. So love to have you along. So this is this is a it's actually a preprint paper paper it's not peer reviewed yet but I I've spent quite some time reading this and it will be it's a very good quality paper um, it's from the Institute of uh, Immunology California University of California uh, they're, they're two separate institutions so so it's it's this good good quality uh, institutions immunological memory to SARS so this is all about memory does the immune system remember after the acute infection. Do you remember that infection you had years ago? You can remember having it, but the point is your immune system, in most cases, remembers it and gives us ongoing immunity, which of course is what we want because we don't want to catch it twice. We don't want to catch it once, but certainly don't want to catch it twice. Just published, so interesting stuff. Right, now, background here is humans make antibodies when we have infections, and in this case, SARS, coronavirus to specific antibodies so we know we make antibodies uh, we make different sorts of antibodies IgMs are made quickly IgGs last for longer and immunoglobulin type A's go into the mucous membrane so different types of antibodies we know that response is there but we also make T helper cells called CD4 plus cells now this is just a technical thing this is related to CD4 uh, eight and four and eight if, if the cell has these it just means that these types of proteins are present on the surface of the cell but these are the t helper cells and these are the t killer cells and also humans make memory b cells now just a brief bit of revision here we have done this before but what we're talking about here are, are the human uh, lymphocytes these cells called lymphocytes and there's two sorts of those there's big and the small they are the two sorts the big ones are the natural killer cells these have long been con considered to be part of uh, innate immunity and that they respond to a wide variety of different uh, viral infections killing the cells from a wide variety of different viral infections but we, we now know from uh, research from um, from uh, Ragad in, in Baghdad that we've interviewed on this channel that the natural killer cells also have an acquired specific immune response as well. Um, but anyway, but back to the thing we're talking about. So, so the small lymphocytes are subdivided into the B and the T. Now these are so-called because the B lymphocytes mature in the bone and the T lymphocytes mature in the thymus gland which is an immune gland behind the sternum. 
Now the B cells are important because it's the B cells that actually produce the antibodies. They actually produce the antibodies and the antibodies of course are the immunoglobulins. Same thing. And immunoglobulins are just the posh, posh name for antibodies. Now, so, but, so, so there's basically only one sort of B cell in that context. But T cells, there's three sorts. There's the, uh, there's the T helpers. There's the T uh, killers or cytotoxics. And there's the T suppressors. Now, the T... Helper cells will stimulate the B cells to produce the antibodies and the T killer cells will directly kill the virally infected cells. So that's a virally infected cell there with the viral particles in it. The T cell will come along and simply kill the whole cell. And then the T suppressor cells tell the other cells when it's time to tone everything down a bit and restrict the immune response because we don't want too much immune response either and we don't want too much inflammation. So that's kind of what we're talking about here. Um, so the memory B cells necessary to make, you know, we, we know, we know all these things are necessary, they make the antibodies. Right, now um, neutralizing antibodies um, have not generally correlated, neutralizing antibodies generally not correlated with uh, lessened COVID-19 disease severity. So what do we mean here? Well, some people have severe disease and low levels of antibodies. Some people have um, minimal disease, but high levels of antibodies in terms of COVID-19. So what this means is there's a lot more going on. So people can actually die with very low levels of antibodies and, or, or high levels of antibodies. The, 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 disease, is not, the disease is not well correlated with the antibody levels, meaning there's other compartments of the immune system that are important. Now, it's not saying antibodies aren't important, they are, but they're only part of the immune response. So what this study is talking about is talking about these as other, uh, the, the antibodies are like one compartment of the immune system. That's like another compartment. That's like another compartment, and that's like another compartment of the immune system is what they're saying. So the antibodies don't correlate well with disease severity, meaning not only are these important, they are, but meaning that these are also very important in the immune response as well. Passively uh, prophylactic antibodies limit disease in animals. So giving the antibodies before someone gets the infection does stop animals getting the disease. Now we're studying this in humans now, but we don't have the data through yet for using antibodies as a prophylactic, although President Trump did seem to do very well after he'd been infected. Uh, but this study shows, says they work less well after infections in animals. But uh, human studies are going on in that now. In other words, what this is saying is if you give someone the antibodies, you're giving them injection of antibodies passively, then that's likely to stop uh, actually the animal. It, it's likely to stop the animal getting the disease. But once the animal's already got the disease, it's not so effective as a therapeutic. Now, we don't know if that's true in humans or not yet. But, but it, again, it's showing that anti antibodies are important, but they're not the only part of the immune response, is what that is telling us. Um, no, so, for example, clinical hepatitis is prevented by vaccine-elicited immunity. In other words, I mean, I've had it. All healthcare workers get a hep B vac vaccine, um, even in the absence of circulating antibodies. So what this means is... Um, I, I've had, uh, I think I've had two or three, it was years and years ago now, I still have a good response to it, I think. But what this means is I could be allergic to, not allergic, immune, <laughs> immune to hepatitis B, but not have the antibodies. In other words, it's the lymphocytes that are providing the immunity. So hopefully if, I, if I'm exposed to hepatitis B at work, I won't develop hepatitis B, even though I have no antibodies because my immune system has been stimulated by the vaccine. So, there's, in other words, there's precedent for this. This is not something new. This is consistent with a lot of viral type uh, infections. Uh, six months or more is usually required to ascertain the durability of immune memory. So we're only at the cusp of being able to understand this now. Just at the cusp of it. Now this study was cross-sectional. It looked at people at one particular period in time. Although having said that, it is following them up. So 185 people. Uh, 41 cases uh, had their first clinical symptoms more than six months ago. 
So most were six months, some were more than six months. They were all recovered from officially diagnosed COVID-19. Uh, male, female, uh, some had mild, moderate, severe disease. Um, multiple sites throughout the United States, although having said that, it was mostly California and New York. 92% uh, were never hospitalised, 7% were hospitalised, roughly consistent with what we're seeing in the United States now, actually. 97% uh, were symptomatic, 2 uh, or 3% had been diagnosed. I know those numbers don't add up, but for 1% the data wasn't available. So, um, good, different sort of variety of, of people there in, involved in the study. Different ages, different geographical areas different levels of severity. Now what did they find? Well in terms of the B cells, remember the B cells that actually make the antibodies, uh, the spike immunoglobulin, that is the antibody to the spike protein of the SARS coronavirus 2 was relatively stable over six months. So the antibodies, this is good news, so the antibodies, there's the virus there and there's the spike protein, the infectious part, so the antibodies that actually neutralise this spike protein, these antibodies here, these lasted for a long time, for six months. So that is encouraging. And of course, once, those, uh, once the antibody is attached to the spike protein, the virus is no longer infectious. We say it's been uh, neutralised by the antibodies that bind to the spike protein. <clears throat> so that's good. They lasted for six months. Uh, spike memory cells were more abundant at... Uh, Six spike memory B cells were more abundant at six months than one month. Now, what is this? What, what this is saying is these antibodies are actually made by the B cells. So, <clears throat> in a sense, whether the antibodies are there or not is not the main thing, because the B cells can make more really quite readily and quickly. So, what the study is saying is that the B cells that make these antibodies to the spike protein, there was more of them six months after infection than at one month. In other words, the level of immunity continued growing for six months. And these were detected in virtually all cases. They didn't give a number on that, but virtually everyone. Um, no apparent half life at five months post infection. In other words, the numbers weren't deteriorating, they weren't going down, the numbers were still going up. <coughs> half life would indicate a reduction in the numbers, but the, the numbers were actually still going up at uh, six months, which is great. Now, smallpox vaccine, we know that works for 60 years. Influenza infection, there was, there was a lady infected, well, she was a girl infected in uh, 1918, and they actually checked her immunity to the. Um, influenza pandemic H1N1 in 2008 and she was still immune to it. So this immunity can last, we know that this, so vaccines here in terms of smallpox, 60 years immunity that we know of, influenza, 90 years that we know of. So this B cell, and th th that's B cell related memory. So there is precedent for B cell related memory lasting for many decades. This is not something uh, that we don't know about, this is already known. But what we know about the B cells for the SARS coronavirus 2 is that the numbers are still increasing after six months, uh, and, and indeed in some patients after uh, eight months. What does this tell us about SARS coronavirus um, B cells uh, a, year, a year after infection? Nothing. We, we don't know. We don't know the future. But the trajectory is looking good and in relation to other vaccinations and active infections, it's also looking good. So looking good for the, uh, for the B cell reaction that make more of the antibodies, make more of these antibodies here any time that we, uh, we would need them. So that is really remarkably hopeful. Now, what about the T cells? Um, SARS coronavirus 2 T helper cells and uh, T killer cells decline with a half life of three to five months. And now this looks a bit concerning, doesn't it? So these other T cells are starting to decrease in numbers slightly after three to five months. Is this an issue? Let's see. Decay of circulating SARS coronavirus 2 uh, killer cells, CD8 plus, they're the T killer cells is consistent with what, what has been reported for other viral infections. So actually what is happening here is consistent with what happens in other 
viral infections. And very often it's not associated with a reduction in the immune response. Because what happens is the numbers in the, so the B cell, the, the B cell numbers goes up for six months. What it's going to do after that, we don't know, but we assume it's going to stay high as it does in other, in, well, no, no, we can't say that. What we can say in, in, in other infections, and we looked at the example of influenza and um, smallpox, that the numbers stayed high for many decades. So what seems to happen with the T cells is, is different. The number of the T cells seems to go down more quickly to begin with, but then it seems to level off. And it seems we only need very low numbers of memory T cells to have an immune response. And this is evidenced by um, smallpox, which uses, uh, uses uh, T helper cells. And uh, here, the, again, the number goes down quickly for the first few months then the half-life overall is, is 10 years. So um, that's in the case of smallpox. And it, even after several decades of halving, the numbers are probably still adequate to generate an immune response. So it looks like we've got different patterns here. B cells, the numbers are going up for the first six months and we believe will enter, a, I, I, from the data I have, believe will enter a plateau. Whereas T cells, the number goes up to begin with, then goes down over a few months, but then plateaus at a lower level. So th th these are just different dynamics of the way this part of the immune system is, is working. T cell memory might reach a stable plateau. This is direct from the authors of the study, not me. Uh, T cell memories might reach a, a stable plateau or slowly uh, or slow decay phase later than the first six months post infection. So it's not saying this is looking bad. It's saying this is consistent with other known types of infections where this sort of pattern is seen. And what, what they're saying is each component of the SARS coronavirus to immune system exhibits distinct kinetics. In other words, changes with time. So, you know, the, the, the way that these different components of the immune system work are all, all vital, but they all kind of do their own thing, if you like, in terms of longevity. Now, what does this mean for immunity and reinfection? Now, let's just summarise the reinfection situation. There's still, in the literature, only 25 cases of confirmed reinfection to SARS coronavirus 2 in the literature. Now, having said that, the standard for that is quite high. So, in other words, it has to be officially, the, the, the virus has to be diagnosed by genetic studies the first time. Then a different virus is diagnosed by genetic studies the second time. And of course, very often that's simply not done. So reinfection occurs. There's, there's 25 cases of reinfection that have been definitely diagnosed, but it definitely occurs more commonly than that. But as far as we know, the people getting reinfected aren't very sick. Now, one, one elderly lady with comorbidities in Belgium, Belgium or Netherlands, one or the other, uh, did die with reinfection, but we believe this is going to be very uncommon. Uh, epidemiologically, there's no evidence for deaths from reinfection yet. I don't believe there will be. And also, memory B and T cell response can take three to five days to successfully respond to an infection. Now, what we're saying here is that, <clears throat> suppose, um, suppose I, I have, I have uh, SARS coronavirus 2 now, then I'll develop memory B and T cells. And then if I'm reinfected in about a year's time, then what will happen is um, those memory B and T cells were there, but it will take three to five days to activate them. So what it means is I could be reinfected and get some SARS coronavirus 2 infection in my uh, nose and mouth for oropharynx, for example. Um, but then three to five days later, the memory B and T cells will activate that and eradicate the infection. But the good thing about SARS coronavirus 2 causing COVID-19 is the complications that people only get sick later on. It's not in the first few days when people are most sick. So even though some people might be reinfected, it looks like the immune system is going to kick in in plenty of time to eradicate the infection before they have the inflammatory response that makes them sick. So it is possible, and some people are saying that up to 10% of people could be reinfected. But the key thing is they're not getting infected. The viral numbers will be kept down, so hopefully they won't be very infectious either. So that is sort of the significance of that. So reinfection can occur, but it will be, it will be eradicated before it's been sufficiently established 
to make us sick before the viral loads have increased significantly is what this is telling us. SARS coronavirus 2 T cells, so sorry, 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 SARS coronavirus 1. This is the SARS coronavirus 1 that caused the SARS in 2003. 70 T cells still detectable 17 years after the initial infection. Wow. And of course, in 10 years' time, we'll look again. Sorry, that's for later. In 10 years' time, we can look again, and it could be 27 years' time. So we know that the, uh, the T cells last for 17 years from SARS coronavirus type 1 from the 2003 outbreak. Um, the other one that we have is, is uh, well, we'll look at that in a minute. So SARS coronavirus 1 causing the 2003 outbreak. Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, first identified in 2012 from camels. And the one we have now, SARS coronavirus 2. They're all very similar viruses. They're called beta coronaviruses. Beta. So scientists like to name things after Greek letters. So the coronaviruses can be divided into alpha, beta, gamma, and delta. Just, just four, I think it's just the first four letters of the Greek alphabet. But, but the, the, the point is that the ones that have caused the severe disease, that the SARS coronavirus 1, 2003, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome 2012, there's still odd cases of the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome crop up. And the SARS coronavirus 2 causing the co current COVID-19 are all very similar or fairly similar beta coronaviruses. And we know this because of the cross immunity. So the SARS coronavirus uh, 2 is most similar to the SARS coronavirus 1. So we know for sure that people that have had SARS coronavirus 1 are still immune 17 years later to SARS coronavirus 2. That is now well uh, documented. So if you had SARS coronavirus, there's only about 8,000 of you in the world, but if you had SARS coronavirus 1 in 2003, it looks like you won't be getting symptomatic SARS coronavirus 2 in 2020 or 2021. Um, so SARS coronavirus 1 is most similar to SARS coronavirus 2. But this other beta coronavirus, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome coronavirus, is also pretty similar. And the geneticists have looked at the proteins. So, so like the proteins there, there's about 90% similarity in some of the proteins. It's a very similar virus. This is, this is less so, but it still seems to be enough to cause cross immunity with the SARS coronavirus 2. Although that's not that well studied. It's amazing how poorly studied this is actually that the MERS is not that well studied. So um, what we know, this is 17 years. Now this is not well studied, but we know, we know this has got at least two years. The T cells respond for uh, there for at least two years. It's almost certainly for the full eight years since 2012, but it simply hasn't been studied. We simply don't know. Someone needs to get onto that. Can some PhD student get onto that, please? We really need to know that. I suspect that people have um, M Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, coronavirus T cells that will kill the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus T cells after eight years. But I don't know that because it simply hasn't been studied. But we do know it lasts for two years. But the SARS coronavirus one we do know for lasts for 17 years. And we do know that the SARS coronavirus 2 is most similar to SARS coronavirus 1. Therefore, the immune system may respond in a roughly similar way. Therefore, my hope is that the immunity to SARS coronavirus one will last for 17 years. I will be proved right or wrong on that over time, but that is the, uh, the evidence so far. Now, impl Im immediate implications. Now, um, there was a chap uh, who had uh, COVID-19 back in April in, uh, in London. He got quite sick. He had to go to intensive care for a couple of days. Then he came out. And then he was a bit sloppy last week and he came into contact with someone who'd, had, who'd recently been tested positive. And he got a ping on the, uh, on the test and trace because he'd been in contact with someone who tested positive. Therefore, he'd been re-exposed to the virus. Now, I think that he means he's immune to the virus. Or if he does get the virus from this person he came into contact with, he'll get some mild viral growth in his mouth and oropharynx, but then it'll, but it'll be quickly eradicated in three to four days as the B and T cells kick in. But again, we're not sure of that yet. 
I would say there's something like a 90% chance he won't get any infection at all. A few percent chance he might get some reinfection, but he, he'll eradicate it while he himself remains uh, preclinical. So given he's had it before, given he's probably immune, does that mean say he doesn't need to self-isolate? Well, let's see what this chap says. I can't remember his name now, actually. Um, anyway, um, I think he's got blonde hair. Um, doesn't matter that we're all go. Doesn't matter that we all doing social distancing. It doesn't matter that I'm fit as a butcher's dog. Feel great. So many people are in my circumstance. So he's saying this doesn't matter. And actually, it doesn't matter that I've had the disease and I'm bursting with antibodies. So presumably, he's had the test. He's still got the antibodies, which is great news. Um, we've got to uh, interrupt the spread of this disease and one of the ways we can do that is now by self-isolating for 14 days when contacted by test and trace so even though this this chap feels great um he's fit as a butcher's dog he's bursting with antibodies because we don't fully understand this yet he is following the 14-day self-isolation rule which of course uh, is more than correct uh, to do, doing 100% the correct thing, at least in this uh, circumstance. So um, what I'm saying is, even though it looks like you won't get sick if you get reinfected, because we don't know about the small but realistic possibility that there could be some viral growth before the B and T cells are able to eliminate it, that could give you rise to a period of infection. Therefore, the 14-day quarantine must be uh, obeyed as normal. We should remember his name. It'll come to me. Right, um, just a quick picture now from Mike, who rides the New York subway. Now, I put this on because this is just a poster from New York. Just put this on because it's um, somewhat encouraging. It's not saying, it's not saying, oh, by the way, you need to wear a mask. That, that's already assumed now, that's why I'm encouraged. It's just saying you've got to wear the mask properly now. So it's telling you how to wear it properly. So uh, cover your mouth and nose. So, nope, not quite. Try again, <laughs> that's the one. There you go. So it's not the fact that people are being told to wear masks. Uh, it's the fact that they are now, some people aren't wearing them quite correctly. So thanks for that, Mike. Um, quite encouraging right that is us for today good news interesting science massive implications as time goes on I, I'm, I'm sure that the well the, the, this science that we have looked at today is already pretty consistent with the epidemiology with, with the lack of people getting sick in reinfections and I, I'm, I'm sure my prediction is that that will, will carry on that there'll be more and more consistency between this science and the blood tests uh, and, and the epidemiology of people not getting reinfected as time goes on. And it's still my belief that in a few seasons we'll be able to eradicate this virus. That is still my belief, but of course it will need the vaccinations. Thank you for watching this video. If you stayed to the end, I know that was quite a hard one, but uh, quite an interesting one. So if you've stayed to the end, uh, be even more encouraged than the people that were that chickened out after the first few minutes.